Hello everyone, thank you for joining me this morning. Again, we are online. The, uh, the coronavirus situation has gotten worse in our area, but again, thanks to technology, we are able as a church to, to at least be continuing in our series, learning together. And I hope from this, you know, there's going to be Bible study questions along with this sermon that you can do with your families, anyone who's in your home, that, you know, we are the church. Actually, I just wanted to give a little explanation as, you know, as a leadership, this is not an easy decision to make, to to cancel church, to to be doing this online. Actually, um, last week, I'm sure a lot of you may know already, but our mayor made an announcement declaring a state of emergency. Our province made that same decision as well. And as, as a leadership, you know, as we are looking at the news, as we're analyzing the situation, our response changes as the news changes, our response initially was to have small groups, to have little house churches, as that was within the recommendations at that time. But the information has changed, and they are now recommending to not meet at all with anyone. And so, and so as, as a leadership, we've decided to, to cancel. But is it biblical to cancel church? That's something we've struggled with. And, and what, what we've come to is, and, and I think, and I, and I hope you realize as well, but the church is not a place. You know, the church is not the link on Sunday mornings where we normally meet. The church is us. You know, we are the church. We are the ecclesia, the, the body of Christ. You know, whether we meet in our homes or in a larger building, we are still that same church. Now, our mandate as the church is to make disciples of all the nations. You know, to tell people about Jesus, to make them disciples, followers of Christ. And if we ignore the recommendations of the health professionals at this time, we're putting the very people we are trying to reach at risk. And that's not going to help us as we try to disciple them, as we try to be a witness to the town of Georgina. You know, and as for the, the edification and the building up of God's people that normally happens that Sunday morning at the link, you know, one thing I've seen over the last week, as we've been stuck more in our homes, I have not seen our church be a scared people hiding in their homes. In fact, what I've seen is a very loving church who are isolating themselves due to the love of others, to, to the vulnerable, not wanting to get them sick. I've seen a church do food deliveries. I've seen a church constantly calling and updating each other to make sure that the other person is okay. I've seen these beautiful things happening. We are still the church. We are still edifying. We are still building up. That has not halted it. In fact, as the situation has gotten worse, and I'm sure as it continues to get worse, the edifying in the building will only grow stronger because we are God's people. Now, I'm tremendously proud of every single person at our church who has either self-isolated because they don't want their kids or others at sick. I, I'm, I'm proud of, of being a people who's not selfish, that we're constantly thinking of others. You know, and as your leadership, as your pastor and, and the elders, we're going to keep analyzing the information. We're going to keep looking at the health recommendations that our government gives us. And, and I hope we'll be back to meeting with each other as soon as possible. But until then, we're going to be doing as the government recommends we do. So we're going to have Bible study questions along with an online sermon so you can do uh, ha have this time of building and learning at, time, at home. Now, last week, and this is getting to our sermon now, last week we looked at our identity in Christ. We've been doing a Holy Spirit series, learning what it means to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we're entering the time now where, where we're speaking about spiritual warfare. How, what, what's the role of the Holy Spirit in, in our spiritual warfare we can encounter ourselves in? Now, why last week I wanted to talk about our identity in Christ is because I believe that is the focus point of spiritual warfare. That is where the enemy attacks us. And in fact, what's interesting, I pointed, pointed this out last week, in almost every single one of Paul's letters, he addresses the, the Christians that he's writing this to, he addresses them as saints, as God's people, as holy, as chosen. He starts off his letters with this, even if he goes into rebuke, even if they're not living their Christian lives perfectly. And we see from a lot of their issues, they were not perfect. But Paul still called them saints. He still called them holy. You know, in Ephesians 5, in Ephesians 1, he addresses them as holy. And then in Ephesians 5, what we see Paul doing is he, he rebukes them and encourages them to not live the way they used to live. 
to not go back into their sin. He lists a lot of sins, sexual immorality, greed, coarse joking, obscenity. He lists these things and tells them not to live that way anymore. And why they should not live that way anymore? Because that's not them. That's not their identity anymore. It's no longer true of them. And he encourages them now to live in the way that is true of you as a spirit-filled people. You know, one thing you will see if you've been a Christian for very long at all is you will recognize that we still struggle with sin. Like that Ephesians church in Ephesians 5 where they sometimes go back to the sins of when they were not Christians. Often that can be the case for us. We, we go back to the way we used to live. We can still s- struggle with sin even though we're called a holy people. Even though we're God's chosen people, a, a temple for him. We still go back to our sin. Now, have you ever wondered this? Have you ever wondered why is that the case? If scripture says that I am a new creation, as 2 Corinthians 5.17, for example, says, If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, and the new is here. Why then do we still sin? You know, we, we read these intellectual truths about ourselves in scripture. We, we read these spiritual truths, but often our situation doesn't look like that. We don't feel holy. We don't look holy. What's the problem here? And what you may not realize, and this is where I think the problem lies, is that when we became believers, when we accepted Christ, when his his Holy Spirit came into us, we declared war on the kingdom of darkness. We declared war on Satan and all his forces. Now, the kingdom of darkness, which is mentioned a lot in scripture, we're given really two, two kingdoms. We're given the kingdom of light, God's kingdom, the kingdom, and Satan's kingdom. Now we, by default, because of the fall of humanity, we're with Satan's kingdom. We're, we were, by default, on his side. But when we accept Jesus, we change sides. We're now with him. We've declared war on Satan and his angels. And because of that, and I hope you're starting to see this makes more sense, we are now in the middle of a war. A huge war, a cosmic war that actually has been going on since the beginning of the universe, depending on when you think Satan fell. You are not growing as a Christian in a perfect, idyllic environment with no sin or temptation. You are growing up as a Christian in the middle of a war zone, in a battlefield, in the trenches. Now in World War I, In the middle of the trench warfare, there started to become the use of chemical weapons, mustard gas. I'm sure you've heard of this in in history class. And at the beginning of its use, it had devastating effect. They had not seen this before. They didn't know what was happening. They didn't know to protect themselves against it. They got annihilated on both sides. But as the war went on, as they learned what this new weapon was and how to defend themselves from it, they started wearing gas masks. They started looking for the signs of when the gas was coming. That attack lost its edge on them. The chemical weapon, which was so devastating, didn't really have as much, still deadly, but didn't have as much of an impact because they knew what it was and they knew how to protect themselves against it. Now, for a lot of us, if we are blind to the attacks of the enemy, it will have devastating effect against us, just like mustard gas did against um, unaware foes. For many of us, we don't know what Satan's tactics are. Some of us don't even know we're in a spiritual war to begin with. So what are Satan's attacks? What are his strategies? What does he focus on? And, And this sermon, I hope, will show you that the lies the enemy is employing to trick you into not living in the freedom of your new identity in Christ, which, which is the focal point of his attack. So if you're at home, please join me to, uh, to Ephesians 6, verses 10 to 12. So Ephesians 6, verses 10 to 12. I'm going to try to put the, the, the text up on the screen for you. So Ephesians 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So we see that our conflict is not with flesh and blood. 
It's not with just this world. It's with the cosmic spiritual forces of darkness, Satan and his kingdom. That's what we're up against as Christians. So, so what is this spiritual war? You know, we see this in Ephesians 6. We, we see all of Ephesians, the, the whole book, it's dealing with our identity and practice in Christ. And then it ends in verse 6 w- w- with this topic of spiritual warfare, of standing firm in Christ, of putting on the armor of God, of standing against this kingdom of darkness. So again, what is this kingdom of darkness? What's the beginning of it? And when we've discussed this in prior messages at Lakeshore, that there was at some point, whether at the beginning of the universe or we don't know that much, that there was a spiritual war that started in heaven that, that, that Satan and his angels rebelled against God. And, and, and in Genesis 3, we see that, th- that this spiritual war that started in heaven came to earth. Um, spiritual warfare was used against Adam and Eve when Satan tricked them into eating the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. And God, God commanded them not to eat the fruit. Satan tricked them. They ate the fruit and humanity fell. Now, how did Satan do this? This is kind of the first act we see of spiritual warfare. How did Satan trick them into eating the fruit that God told them not to eat? And we see he deceived them. He tricked them. He lied and and tricked them into eating the fruit, that God was holding something for them, that God didn't want them to be like him. And so he lied and tricked them and they fell. And in fact, look at the first thing we learn about Satan in Genesis 3. We learn that he was more crafty and cunning than any of the other animals God made. He was cunning. He was crafty. He was a liar. So we know Satan is smart. He's cunning. He knows how to trick you. He's been around a long time. He's not God. He's not anywhere as powerful as God. You can't even compare them. But he's a liar. He's tricky. So what else does scripture say about spiritual warfare and about Satan's tactics of deceiving us? So in 2 Corinthians 11.3, But I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray by your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. We see here that Paul writes that the serpent Satan is cunning, that he will try to lead them astray from their devotion to Christ. And in Acts 5.3, another another text, Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Now here is a very interesting story. If some of you know the story of, of Ananias and Sapphira, um, so in the early church, Ananias and, and Sapphira, Sapphira were believers, more richer believers who sold one of their properties. Um, in the early church, this was a more common thing that more wealthy believers would sell some of their property or sell possessions and then distribute the money to the church. They would give it to the disciples and it would go to feeding people and helping people and, and continuing the ministry. Really what we see like today with tithing. Now, the people were doing this out of goodwill. They loved each other. They wanted to bless each other with money. But Ananias and Sapphira, what they did is they sold one of their properties, but they kept most of the money for themselves. So they, they wanted to look like philanthropists, when in reality they were selfish. They wanted to look like uh, benevolent saints, when in fact they kept the money for themselves. And look what, say, oh, look what Peter says to them, that Satan filled their hearts. That Satan led them do, into doing this. Now, they had to take full responsibility for their actions. They did them. But who tempted them into doing this? It wasn't just themselves. It wasn't their evil desires because they were believers. It was Satan. Satan tricked them. In John 8, 44, another text. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And in this text, we see something key, and and we have to understand this, is that Satan is the father of lies. That there is absolutely no truth in him or his enemies. Not his enemies, his allies. He never tells the truth, ever. There's no truth to what Satan says. And and we see the primary tactic, the way the enemy attacks us, the way he attacks believers, is to confuse us, to lie to us, and trick us 
into living like our new Christian identities are not true. He lies to us. We are tempted constantly, actually, in the same way Adam and Eve are tempted. We're lied to, we're deceived because Satan's cunning. He wants to trick us. He does not want us to live as Christians. He doesn't want us to live in our new identity. So we see that the main focus of the attacks of the enemy are to mess up us living in our new identity as saints, as God's chosen people. Now, the major difference between us and Adam and Eve is that you know, we, are, we are believers. We are made pure by Christ's sacrifice. You know, because Jesus died for us on the cross, that we might give in to temptation. We might, uh, we might give in to sin, but we can't fall twice because this Christ's life is now true of us. So we might mess up, but we can't fall twice. Now, why Satan goes after us then? And you, you might ask, well, if he can't make us fall in the same way Adam and Eve fell, why doesn't he leave us alone? Aren't we secured? Why, why, why then attack us if he can't change our final destination? Now, why Satan goes after us, why he lies and why he tempts us, is because he does not want us living in the truth of our new identity. Now, what do I mean by this? What do I mean by this? Well, look at Paul's letters. Look at, look at Ephesians 5, for example. In Ephesians 5, verses 8 to 11, it says this, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live then as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Paul's encouraging them not to live like they used to live when they were in darkness, when they weren't believers. In 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3, which I read earlier, But I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. <clears throat> now you see, Satan cannot take away your new identity. Last week we talked about this because that's our foundation. It's in Christ. Our new identity is bought by his blood. It can never be taken away. Christ made you a saint. So now you are one regardless of anything you do. But Satan can tempt you to live in the ways of your old identity. He can't change your identity. But he can tempt you to live as though your new identity is not true. He can, he can, he can tempt you into living like nothing has changed for you in a practical sense. Now, how he does this, and this is where we're going to focus the bulk of our mess of the message, is the three major lies Satan tells you to get you to live like your new identity is not true. Now, there's a lot more lies, and some can be individual, but I find most of these lies fall into one of these three categories, and these are the major ones. And the first major lie that Satan uses against us is that we should chase after the fleshly things of this world. That we should live the same way we used to live when we were non-Christians. Now how Satan does this is he, is he lies to us making us think that we're missing out. That maybe God is withholding something good and pleasurable from me that I could be enjoying. Um, in, in Ephesians 5.18 it's summarized like this. Do not get drunk on wine which leads to debauchery. Now, why, what Paul is summarizing with this statement is the lifestyle of the Gentile Christians before this. That the enemy is tempting them to get drunk on wine, to live in the ways of the flesh. To live as they used to, instead of being filled with the Spirit, which is the Spirit of Christ, their new identity. Now, how Satan tempts us to live this way is getting us to think that these things are better than what we have in Christ. He makes them desirable, like they're, like they're good, what, what, that it's something we should have. And look at the sins, for example, that he mentions. He mentions sexual immorality, greed, impurity, obscenity, foolish talking, coarse joking. And look at the two categories these sins are in. You know, we have sex, we have greed, we have um, obscenity, impurity. These are, the, are really the human sinful desires of the flesh. You know, fleshly desires, sex, um, all of these things. And the second category, foolish, foolish joking, coarse language. Um, these are really almost more the desires to fit in with the world. You know, with the first half, we can desire the things of this world, the sex, the, the greed, the money, all of those things. And the second is we can want to fit in by, by talking and acting like the world as well. As, as, as God's people, as saints, Satan does not, want, does not want you to live like a saint. He wants you to live like you're still in sin. 
to think that that these things to give into the ways of the world to have the things of the world will help your current circumstance and let's look for for a minute at sexual immorality as an example sexual immorality is one of those areas addressed again and again and again in scripture and why i believe this is is because it's it's everywhere you know look at our society today sexual immorality is everywhere it needs to be addressed constantly because it, it's so rampant and god god created us to need intimacy to need love and a part of that love is to have sexual intimacy but he intended it to be between a man and a woman in a heterosexual committed monogamous relationship that's how he intended it he intended it that way and what satan does is he takes something good that sexual intimacy and he and he perverts it he want, he wants us to try to seize that thing through illicit means through outside of marriage with, with people of the same gender as us he he wants us to go after a good thing but in all of the wrong ways so he lies to us he tricks us and he also tricks us by making us think that this thing sexual immorality greed money that this thing will give me happiness that it'll, it'll get joy to my life i think one of the most famous quotes from a billionaire when asked is you know how much money is enough he responded always a little bit more you know we chase after these things whether it's sexual immorality whether it's money whether whether it's anything we all of our things we chase after them because we're deceived into thinking they're the ultimate thing we're really deceived into thinking that they'll save us that it'll bring us joy it'll bring us peace but that's a lie it won't happen it can never happen it's a lie rather than living in the freedom the power of our new identity rather than being filled with the spirit growing in the glory of Jesus Christ we can so often be filled with wine that leads to debauchery as stated in Ephesians because we think these things were deceived that these other things will actually make us happy now the definition of debauchery in Ephesians 5:18 in this context it it means to be spilt to be empty to be wasted think of a a glass on the table that's knocked over and poured and it spills everywhere it's wasted it's spilt out and i believe that perfectly illustrates what satan's trying to do to us he can't take away our salvation he can't take away your identity but he can get you to completely waste your time by not living in it by living for other things by being emptied by giving in a debauchery he can do that and he wants to do that by making you take the things of this world and making them ultimate things another major lie the enemy uses as believers is condemnation for our sins that we are condemned for our sins as believers now this is the one two punch of the enemy you know what he does is he leads you into temptation he 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 brings the things of this world in front of you to tempt you and then when you fall for it he condemns you he accuses you for it you know this is part of his character we see in revelation 12:10 that satan is the one who accuses them before our god day and night He lies to you thinking uh getting you to think that you're no different that you really haven't changed at all that even though you you know you accepted Christ and whatever that you're no different that you're the same person that no you're almost worse than you used to be these are accusations condemnations that Satan brings into our mind and as a pastor I see the result of this all the time I see Christians who are defined as God's holy people, a chosen race, a royal priesthood. That's who we are now in Christ. And we're living like the exact opposite is true. We're living in absolute defeat and self-condemnation for sin we have already been forgiven for. Romans 8 verse 1, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So where is this condemnation coming from? It's not coming from God. it's not coming from him. Now, because as Christians we have the Holy Spirit in us, when we are living in ways that are not true of who we are now, the Holy Spirit convicts us. It does. It convicts us to move away from these things. The Holy Spirit definitely does do that, but that is different than condemnation. And so often I see people filled with self-condemnation, like they have not been forgiven. You know if we as believers if we are walking around totally condemned by sin we have already been forgiven for with acting like we have no freedom how are we possibly going to share the message of freedom and forgiveness to others if we ourselves are not living in the truth of that message 
How can we tell someone else about the freedom and forgiveness they can have in Jesus Christ when we ourselves are not living in the truth of that? And the reality is most of us won't share that message because it doesn't have power or we're not living in the truth of it. And this leads us to the last main lie of the enemy that he uses to confuse us and trip us up in our identity in God and our identity in Christ. He, he's, remember, he tempts you into living in the way of this world, to, to living in the way of the flesh and a sinning. He then condemns you for that sin. And then what he does, the, the last major lie we're talking about, is he tries to get you to live in the reality of the old covenant, the law, living under the law, by trying to get you to atone for your sin. So he tempts you into sin. He accuses you for that sin. And then what does he get you to do? He tries to get you to atone for that sin by making it up to God. Now, what is atonement? What's this old law, this old covenant I was talking about? Now, the old covenant, the law, was, it was a time in the, in the Old Testament up until when Jesus died on the cross and rose again for us, entering this new era of the new covenant, was a time where we had to pay for our sins. We had to try to meet the standard of the law so we could enter into a relationship with God, and, and we couldn't do it. And so there were sacrifices for our sins. There would be for the Jews. There was the Day of Atonement where they would put all of the, all of the sin of the people on a lamb and then sacrifice that lamb. That's why sacrifices were such an important part of it. Because a price needed to be paid for our sins. In Jesus and in his atoning work on the cross, in, in 1 John 2 verse 2, it reads that he was the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. When you became a believer, when the Spirit of God entered you, your sins, past, present, and future, the sins of the whole world, your old identity died on the cross with Jesus. When you believed in him, when he became your Lord, your old identity died on the cross with him. And your new identity, just as Christ rose from the grave, and just as he lives forever, we too rose with him. Our identity is tied to him. We are now in the era of the new covenant where it's all done by the work of Jesus Christ, not ourselves. All atoning work was done on the cross by Jesus. You are completely forgiven. And that's the way of the new covenant. That's the way of, of this new identity we're in. But often we like the new covenant with sprinklings, with a, a little bit of seasoning of the old covenant. Satan often pushes us to do this. Look, in our prayers, and, and this is, I think, the greatest tell for it. In our prayers, are we coming before God, thanking him for his forgiveness, praising his name, just living in the joy of the freedom we have, even though we sin, even though we, we bring our sin to God, we're not bringing it for forgiveness anymore because we are already forgiven. We are bringing it to him so we can be healed, so we can move past it, so that we can thank him more for his grace on us. Or are we coming before God self-condemned? Are we coming before God having a pity party for ourselves? Are we coming before God groveling, self-flagellating ourselves so that God will forgive us? Is that your reality? Because that is not what we are called to do as new covenant believers. In fact, that is, that is like you are living under the old covenant if that's you. We start to doubt how God could forgive us again and again. Satan gets us to do this. And, and, and when you look at this, you don't see freedom. You don't see a new identity, new covenant Christian. You see an old covenant living under the burden and death of the law person. The enemy constantly wants you to think that there needs to be another atonement. That you need to prove to God that you've changed. That you need to, to, to make up for what you've done by convincing them that you'll do better next time. Does that sound like you? That you're not going to mess up again. That you're going to do better. Don't you see is that that's a false way of thinking. That's a self-condemning way of thinking. And it is not true of who you are. Now what I don't mean by this is I don't mean that sin doesn't matter. Sin does matter. Like Paul was saying, look, look at what we have. If we live... In sin, if, if we are con continually getting drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, that's a, what a waste of who we are now. That's not true of us anymore. It's foolish. 
It's complete idiocy to live that way as opposed to being filled with the Spirit, which leads to joy, which leads to peace. Why on earth would we live the old way? But nothing can separate us from Christ. Now, often I think people who live this way either don't believe their new identity in Christ or they don't know their new identity in Christ. In Romans 8, 33 to 34, Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. Who shall separate us? From the love of God. You know, if this is you right now, if you're in self condemnation, you know, if you've been living like you need to atone for your sins, what do you say to this? Who can separate you from God's love now? And in fact, who can condemn you? The judge has declared you justified. There is no one who can condemn you now because the only one who could condemn you, because you accepted Christ, if that's true of you, if you've, if you've accepted Christ, There's no one to condemn you now because God has made you holy. You are now called to live in that holiness. The enemy loves to lead us into temptation. He loves to condemn us for it and then he loves to try to make us atone for that sin. This work, these three major lies, the, the, the tempting us into living in the way of the flesh, the condemning us for our sins, and then the trying to make us atone for our own sins, These lies are to mess us up, to get us to not live in our new Christian identity. He can't take that identity away from you. But his major attacks against you are to prevent you from living in the joy and freedom of that identity. To try to prevent you from getting anyone else to live in that identity as well. Has Satan been getting you to believe these lies? Have you been attacked with any one of these? If that that was me for a long period of my life... But as we're in scripture, as we learn more, as the Holy Spirit fills us with his glory and the redemptive work of Jesus, we can learn that these are truly lies. That we don't have to live in self-condemnation. We don't have to atone for our sins. All of that work was done by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this spiritual conflict is all about truth. It's a truth war. And how we can fight against this, and we're going to be talking about this more next week when we look at the armor of God, is instead of being filled with wine, all of those fleshly sins, which, is, which leads to debauchery, instead of that, to be filled with the Spirit. The filling of the Spirit, we talked about it in prior messages, is to be filled with the glory of Jesus Christ, his redemptive work, and the truth of your new identity. To be filled with its reality, not just its intellectual truth, but its physical, present, spiritual reality for you. Are you constantly being filled with that new reality, the glory of what Jesus Christ has done for you? Or are you being filled with the lies of the enemy, filled with the the thoughts of self-condemnation, filled with the thoughts of still trying to atone for sins that have already been atoned for by Jesus Christ? Is that you? Now, in a second... I'm going to have statements of, uh, of scripture up on the screen with, with some music behind it. And these are, are going to be statements about your new identity in Christ. You know, I want you to, and whoever you're with watching this, I just want you to take some time to reflect on these truths. These are identity statements. And these are also declarations of war you can use against the enemy. If you're feeling thoughts of, of self-condemnation, you know, quote Ro- Romans 8 at this. Who can condemn me anymore? Christ Jesus has died for me. He stands at the right hand of God. Who can condemn me? Who can separate me from Christ's love? As these statements are on the screen, I I ask that you reflect on them and that you pray with the groups or family members that you are watching this video with, that, that you would no longer live in the lies of the enemy, but that you would live in the truth and freedom of your new identity in Jesus Christ. Thank you for watching. Please stay in and watch these statements of truth that will be on the screen.